So our speaker today is going to talk about the reintroduction efforts here in Western Montana. Uh, ben Deagle has been studying and working to conserve Western birds for nearly 30 years. He earned a master's degree from the University of Montana in 1995, studying a remnant population of sharp-tailed grouse in the Blackfoot Valley, and continued gaining experience working for Idaho Fish and Game and the Bureau of Land Management on sharp tails and sage grouse. He went on to work for over a decade with the National Wildlife Federation from Missoula, leading their sage grouse conservation program on the west side, and eventually moving the project to Montana Audubon. Presently, he is president of the Big Sky Upland Bird Association and is working in a public-private partnership to restore sharp-tailed grouse to Western Montana. So thanks, Ben, for coming up from Missoula today and uh, our speaker. Yeah, thank you. Test, test. Can you hear me? Great. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. I, I think I first uh, was contacted by David in 2020 um, to give this talk, and, and I'm glad I'm doing it tonight instead of then because there's a lot more to report, a lot more has gone on since then. Um, sharp tailed grouse are a fabulous bird. Is, is, raise your hand if you haven't ever seen one. Okay, well, put it on your bucket list. Um, they're, they're a fabulous bird. Uh, in part because of their fantastic courtship behavior, uh, lecking, where the males will gather in a traditional location year after year. Um, I'll show you some video of that shortly. Um, but I first started studying them in, in, uh, when I came to grad school in 1994, and there was a remnant population right outside Ovando in the Blackfoot Valley. Um, there there's also been a population up on the Tobacco Plains where there is a lot of work done historically to try and conserve that population, but it, it eventually was lost. Um, Lewis Young was one of the principals in that effort, and I think he's probably listening in tonight. Um, and uh, he's been invaluable um, to this new phase of the effort to try and restore the bird to Western Montana. So um, without any further introduction, I'll just jump into this. Um, I built this slideshow to be an, an hour long show and we might have time to get it all in plus some Q&A from you guys. So um, there's several different subspecies of the Tympanucus. Um, there's the, the shark tailed grouse is here in the, in the northern range. And then there's prairie chicken showing on this map down in, in, in the southern range. Um, there's five different subspecies of sharp-tailed grouse, um, the Alaskan, the Colombian, the Plains, and the Northern. Montana is right on the boundary um, between the Colombian um, and uh, the Plains sharp-tailed grouse. Here's the historic and present range in Montana. Um, we've lost them from... We've lost them from this part of their range. Um, they're still quite frequent and abundant in the rest of the state. Historically, um, most of the work on conserving sharp-tailed grouse was focused on the Colombian subspecies because it's the one that was defined the most. Um, here you can see the historic range in green and then just these little remnants left in yellow. Uh, the National Bison Range uh, attempted to establish the bird between 1973 and 1980. Um, that effort was unsuccessful. There was the Tobacco Plains effort that I mentioned, where there were 140 birds moved um, into that area to try and sustain the population, and it was extirpated around 2000. And then there's the Blackfoot Valley population that I studied that also winked out right around 2000. There were some um, anecdotal reports of small numbers of sharp tails from a couple of the ranches in the Blackfoot after 2000, up to about 2003, but the last time I saw the birds was in 2000. Sorry, that's me. Okay. So, has okay. here is the last endemic sharp tail in the Blackfoot Valley. Um, that's me holding one in, holding that bird in 2000. 
Um, we don't know what happened to that bird or that handsome young man. <laughs> so why did Western Montana sharp-tailed grouse decline? Um, this is the often the most frequently asked question, and um, we'll probably never know, but there's some strong theories. Habitat degradation and, and fragmentation, particularly due to conifer tree expansion, which resulted from fire suppression. We know that a lot of Montana, and Western Montana was no exception, was frequently burned by the native peoples. And historically, this created a lot more grassland as opposed to forest in Western Montana. And as the tribe's land management practice of burning um, phased out and Forest Service fighting forest fires phased in, uh, we've had a lot more evergreen tree encroachment into the valley bottoms. And also the uh, passes that connected the central Montana prairies to the western Montana prairies. Um, so as these habitats decline, the population has got smaller. And at that point, stochastic events more than likely kicked in. Those are things like bad weather patterns, cold, wet spring, deep, deep snow years. Um, we then ended up with this pipe population isolation because the mountain passes had filled in with trees. And our birds on the west side were no longer connected to the central and eastern Montana meta population. And at that point, we think fertility issues might have kicked in, essentially inbreeding fertility, where small isolated populations, shark tails typically will lay eight eggs in a clutch, uh, potentially only six of those eggs hatched or five of those eggs hatched. And that's all it took to tip the population into a downward spiral. You can? Yep, I'm trying. Must be here. Try it again. There it is. Okay. Um, there's been some good scientific work done on inbreeding depression in um, prairie grouse, um, in particular in prairie chickens. Um, there was a, a wonderful opinion piece put together by Michael Soleil and Scott Mills, um, Scott being from the University of Montana, um, having to do with the fact that um, you need to pay attention to more than just habitat quality and extent. Um, while habitat quality and extent is what causes a population to get so small that it deals with infertility problems, even if you improve the habitat after that, the population will not regrow to uh, occupy because of the fertility problem. At that point, you need to bring in fresh genes. A lot of this came out of uh, Westermeyer's work um, having to do with prairie chickens in Illinois. So you saw that last bird in the Blackfoot Valley in, in 2000. Um, why did it take 20 years for a reintroduction effort to begin? Um, a big part of it was genetic uncertainty. We didn't know if the birds that had disappeared from western Montana were Colombians, as historically we believe, or if they were plains shark tailed grouse. Um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, the state, is in charge of the management of shark tailed grouse, and they generally prioritize huntable populations. Um, shark tails, there hasn't been an open season for them in western Montana since before World War II. And so there was, uh, they were low on FWP's priority list. Um, also, the, the federal government hadn't, hadn't gotten involved in terms of them being petitioned uh, for endangered species protection. And so there was no motivation there. Um, and also uh, the project lacked adequate funding and private partners. What changed was some new partners emerged. Uh, I'm currently president of the Big Sky Plum Bird Association. That was one of the partners. Um, we helped fund, along with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and the Confederated Salish and Kootenai, a genetic analysis of the birds. Uh, we collected samples from across the state, um, and we uh, uh, had them sent in for analysis. Um, unfortunately, it took us, initially we sent in the samples without a budget to have them analyzed because of the genetic expert at Washington Fish and Wildlife um, said uh, that they would do the analysis. They didn't. Um, instead, the samples sat at the bottom of their freezer for seven years. 
Um, we finally um, got enough funds together um, to get the samples out of the bottom of the freezer and, uh, and the analysis done. We also had a, a ranch partner show up more recently, the MPG Ranch of the Bitterroot Valley, um, that has um, a tremendous amount of uh, work underway in conservation biology. Um, and they got interested in the project and they've been instrumental at this point in moving it forward. Fish, Wildlife and Parks um, approached Montana State University, uh, Dr. Lance McNew, to put together a restoration plan for Western Montana. Um, that was completed with a good team of his students in, in 2017. And um, the Fish and Wildlife Commission approved his plan in 19. Um, and uh, FWP committed mitigation monies to Libby Dam construction to help fund the project. So this is how the genetic question in part was resolved. Um, James Elrod, um, a pioneer biologist in this area, um, he collected sharp tailed grouse. He shot them around Flathead Lake, Colson, the Hot Springs Valleys um, in 1895. And those uh, mounted museum specimens have sat in the University of Montana Museum ever since in their collection. Um, I went in and, and clipped some feathers and some tissues from those samples. And um, we compared them with um, birds that are presently found in central and eastern Montana, as well as Washington State, um, uh, Nevada, and elsewhere. What we found is that the birds from Powell County, which is the Blackfoot Valley here, the, the uh, Red Diamond, they clustered with the Plains sharp-tailed grouse that's found in central and eastern Montana. Uh, similarly, here you can see in this depiction, the Palo County birds um, were much more closely related to sharp-tails from all over the rest of central and eastern Montana um, than they were related to the birds in Washington State, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, the ones that are known to be Colombian sharp-tails. So we had an opportunity. We also assess the habitat quality in some different places in Western Montana to see how it compared to the places where we already had um, large and abundant populations of, of sharp tails elsewhere in Montana. And what we found is there were some areas with bright orange uh, that is habitat quality as good or better than habitat in, in, in Central and Eastern Montana where the birds are surviving quite well. So we knew there was at least some limited habitat we could put them into. When you compared the brood habitat quality, um, it was it was comparable uh, in the Blackfoot, um, Flathead, and, and Drummond Valleys, as well as the Bitterroot, to the habitat quality out in central and eastern Montana, the Rocky Mountain Front, the High Woods, and the Winterfoot Country. Winter habitat quality also um, was similar. Um, with the exception being that we had extremely good winter habitat quality on the Rocky Mountain front. We don't have anything comparable to it in Western Montana. Um, if this is the limiting factor for the birds, the reproduction um, may have trouble. I mentioned that MSU had put together a plan. Um, it's about 130 pages in length, lots of detail, lots of very useful information. Um, they did um, some simulations of uh, uh, what different population sizes and habitat quality does to affect the persistence of populations. And um, they found that there were some scenarios. This one up here in red is, is a scenario where the population could very well, the reproduce population could very well last 50 years, um, which is this axis here. This is years from now. The probability of extinction, um, they went through a bunch of different scenarios. Um, uh, there are um, some scenarios where the probability of extinction was 98% of the reintroduced population, but there were also some scenarios where um, if you improve the habitat quality even moderately, um, you could get up into the 95% or higher chance of a 50 year persistence of the reintroduced population. <sighs> 
So the plan goal overall is to restore one or more sharp tailed grouse populations in Western Montana by 2031. And our method, methods have to do with transplanting 75 males initially, uh, males that we caught off fall lex. Um, this last September, we went out to Miles City, an area where the population was large and the, the lek trends were up. We, we caught and moved just males to Western Montana, we leased them in three places. What we're going to do subsequently is move 180 birds every spring um, to join those 75 males or what's surviving of them. Um, we put those males out with radios on each one of them so that we know where they aggregate potentially next spring into Lex. And if we, if particularly where we find Lex aggregating in our Western Montana valleys, that's where we will put the next 180 birds. Um, the other uh, important part to our methods is we believe that we'll need to enhance habitats. If we can get um, basically a beachhead established of these populations um, and we understand the areas that they're using, we'll then try and enhance those habitats in ways um, that reduce the stressors on the birds. We also will need to assess into the future the need for genetic rescue. We may still have populations that are too small to be genetically diverse 10 or 20 years out, and we'll need to bring additional birds in uh, to supplement the heterozygosity of those populations. The Big Sky Upland Bird Association, where I'm president, is an association of upland bird hunters. Um, but we're committed to this project, not necessarily believing um, that we'll ever have a hunterable population again in Western Montana. It's not really our objective. Um, we're interested in this because it's um, at this point, I believe, and I checked with Jeff Marks on this, who um, Dan knows pretty well. Um, we believe that sharp-tailed grouse are the only bird that historically bred in Western Montana that today is absent. With the restoration of breeding populations of trumpeter swans and sandhill cranes, and maybe a few others, uh, sharp tails are the only one that's missing. And so our organization is committed to bringing them back for that reason alone. So a huntable population isn't the goal, but it may be a byproduct. So uh, I mentioned lex at the beginning of the talk. So what is a lek? Um, a lot of people know, especially people like you, that birds sometimes breed in lex. But uh, did you know there's several species of fish and insects that also um, use lex? Um, a lek is where multiple males gather repeatedly to compete for breeding opp opportunities with visiting females. But there's also leks of mayflies on the east shore of Flathead Lake in the, in the summertime. Um, there's leks of some other types of fish where the males gather and display and females come in to pick a mate from the best looking one. I'll give you 30 seconds of um, lek video if we can get that to play. We'll give it a whirl here. I'll just talk through this. Um, See if you can pick out the females in the, in the video here. This is a, a male that's displaying with multiple other males in the background. I don't know if we can get any audio. There we go. No doubt why they're called sharp-tailed grouse, huh? Yeah, so this this was the hen over over here that was standing there, sort of in an upright posture. She was she was evaluating the males, trying to figure out which one um, she should mate with. Um, sharp tails are polygamous. The males contribute nothing to either incubation or raising the chicks. The, the hens head off and uh, lay their eight eggs um, within about three weeks of being inseminated on the leg, and uh, they're on their own with their brood for the rest of the summer. So um, in my introduction, one of the things that was mentioned was that I'd worked on sage grouse for several years. I put together a program called adopt a lek with the National Wildlife Federation, where we monitored, um, trained people to be citizen scientists to go out and count sage grouse at their leks um, throughout um, Montana, as well as five other Western states. 
And through this, it became very obvious that citizens have a lot to contribute to grouse conservation. In fact, at one point, we were collecting as much data um, as any of the state agencies um, in, in the West about uh, sage grouse trends. And so I've now adapted this project um, to sharp tailed grouse conservation. And for the last two years, we've been spend, sending people out to count sharp tailed grouse legs across Montana to find out where the largest leks are, where the trend is upward, because um, we're trying to identify source leks um, where we could uh, responsibly go out and trap and move some of the birds without damaging those existing leks. Um, here's four of the different areas we went to in the state um, looking at birds. Um, and out here in southeast Montana, the Mile City country is where we found the largest, most uh, abundant population uh, currently experiencing an, an upward trend. It also happened to be one that's pretty influenced by evergreen trees. Um, there's a lot of Doug fir and ponderosa pine um, in some of the, the hills there east of Miles City. And we wanted to have a better ecological match for birds that we brought to Western Montana because of the evergreen tree factor. There's no bright green. Um, there's other potential source uh, populations near Shoto, Cascade, Columbus, Lewistown, Miles City, Plentywood. And we're just now in the process of, of sorting out where we're going to be going this spring to catch those next 180 birds. Ideal source legs are large legs, uh, a large leg being over 15 males. Um, one thing that I and other people have observed is when you get legs, when they shrink to the size of where you've got 10 or fewer males on them, they don't seem to be as effective or as anchored to a particular location. They tend to bounce around, they tend to fragment more. So we want to leave the legs large even after trapping. Um, we need to be in areas where uh, we have something like 300 males uh, on the, the legs in the surrounding territory um, because um, we'd like to catch and move um, one third of those. Um, so take 100, leave 200 behind. We also want areas with better roads, places that aren't going to shut down um, as soon as there's a little bit of rain or snow or snow melt. Um, gumbo country, we want to avoid at all costs. Um, also pastures with fewer livestock or fewer wildlife conflicts. Um, there's places where we don't want to send people out into blinds in the middle of the night waiting for dawn um, if there's a heavy, heavy grizzly, grizzly use, for example. Um, the, what we're delivering from the adopt -Elect project is, is the LEC size data, um, the extent to which the LECs are associated with conifers, are there conifers nearby. Everybody collects feathers out there on the LECs um, that will go into a, a genetic database so that we understand the, the composition of the LECs we're sampling from. Um, and we need places where we can uh, um, get permission from landowners and lessees for vehicle access. Um, we support our volunteers with not very much. We give them a mileage reimbursement uh, and $25 per, per diem, as well as access to an equipment library if people need good scopes or that sort of thing or GPS devices. We set up camps both where we're trapping birds on the east side as well as where we're releasing them on the west side. Mostly we're on federal and state property in eastern Montana. Um, and then uh, our release camp is this year was at the Drum and Fishing Access site where we would do some final processing of the birds before releasing them in three different valleys from there. Um, so there are participation opportunities. Uh, we need people on, on trapping teams, release teams, we need drivers, and we need people to do seasonal monitoring to figure out where those big lecks are that we maybe haven't had a chance to look at yet. The participants, um, the qualifications, we had a really neat group of about 15 people all told. Um, we asked for, for people that can give us a 10 day commitment uh, to both train and, and be out in the field. People that have their own four by four vehicle, people that have good landowner um, skills and, and outdoor skills. Um, ideally, some people will have animal handling experience. And maybe the most important thing is to have a cheery morning attitude because every, every morning starts at 4 a.m.
Um, here's some of our volunteers that you, you might recognize um, Diane Boyd here. Um, she's a longtime <laughs> biologist, uh, recovery biologist in Northwest Montana, as well as many other states. Sharp tails are her favorite bird. Um, she also, with her uh, pointing dog, she has a German wire here, might um, shoot as many sharp tails as, as any um, woman in the state. She's a very avid hunter of them, um, but wants to keep them alive and expand their population as well. Um, so we've had both uh, active and, and retired natural resource uh, agency people, bird watchers, upland bird hunters, college students and instructors. Some landowners even jump in and, and help out with, with the project, both on the central and, and uh, west side, um, as well as other non-governmental organizations. We also would like to see potentially the Confederated Salish and Kootenai join this effort at some point. Um, they did help with the genetic analysis funding. Um, they did do some analysis with a, a scientist by the name of Don Pantizano about 15 years ago, the quality of their habitats. Um, they have interest from their cultural committee um, because there's stories of um, sharp tails that they used to, to um, catch uh, on Lex near Polson. Um, and some of their dances, they have the chicken dance, which imitates sharp tail very clearly. Um, so it's a culturally important bird, and maybe the tribes will join us at some point. So you may be wondering, how do you catch sharp tails? Well, um, we basically, we use a walk-in trap. This is a little bit hard to see, but this is, this is a passageway that's created into a dead-end um, square screen box. Um, and what this is, is essentially, it sort of looks like a crab trap. If any of you have ever caught crab or, or shrimp out in the ocean, uh, instead of putting a, a crab trap on the bottom of the ocean, we're putting a bird trap on the top of the prairie. And the shark tails come to dance on this lek. You can see how the vegetation in this traditional lek location, that isn't vegetation that we've cut or trampled down. It was a lot shorter than the surrounding vegetation. And sharp tails will select sites like this to have their traditional leks on. Um, males would come in at dawn to attempt to dance in the middle of the lek. And on the way, as they were walking in, they would get intercepted by these wire fences and they would be guided into a cot, a uh, dead end cage that they um, then would not be able to find their way out of. Um, we'd be sitting nearby in blinds and jump out and net them out of these pots. Does it disturb the leks? Yes. Um, we, but we, we established as a standard, we want it to be on a particular like no more than three days. And then we would go away um, for a week at least and sometimes not come back at all. Um, uh, but, but sometimes we would come back a week later. But even on day one, um, these birds would, would come in and land right on top of the pots if it was in, in their way. Um, we didn't really see a dramatic change in behavior. Um, they, they actively uh, displayed with each other. And we were in blinds nearby and would jump out as soon as we had spotted um, two or more birds uh, in the pots. Do we damage the source legs? Um, we hope not. And we're trying to take every precaution to not do so. Um, common lex sizes are 10 to 40 males. And like I mentioned earlier, we only target lex with more than 15 males. Um, we assume the leks have equal numbers of males and females, even though we think it's possible that there's substantially more females in the population. It might be two females to every male, basically because life is riskier to be a male sharp-tailed grouse. Um, standing around on the, on the same few yards of, of territory for up to 90 days a year um, is a risky behavior. Um, these legs tend to be predator magnets, and um, we see evidence of a lot of males being killed on legs by predators. Females don't have um, quite as much risk in their life. Um, our leg quota we established for each leg, and that was to take 30% and leave 70%. So our statewide trapping quota that the commission has given us is 180 birds a year. The background mortality rate of, of sharp tail adults seems to be about 40% a year, regardless of what's going on. Um, the annual Montana hunter harvest is between 15 and 25,000 sharp tail a year. 
So we're taking a, a fraction of 1% of the, the annual take from the population. As, as we trap the birds on the legs, what, what's next? Well, you, you quickly go out to these pots. You have a long handled net that you use um, to scoop the birds out of the, the wire cage. You put them into cotton bags, and then you put them in liquor boxes um, to transport them back to the processing camp. We've really found that these work best. You, you can, um, my wife and I spent many evenings with liquor boxes, um, tearing apart the, the guts of them. Uh, usually there's a cardboard divider that would make six compartments and we converted it into just a, a two compartment box for, for each of these. Then you take them back to the processing tent. And um, at the processing tent, we had teams of people um, working to uh, uh, go through the birds, check them for health, check them for, for parasites, weigh them, uh, take blood samples. Um, this is all the equipment it took to process just a, a single bird. Um, we put four bands on each bird with a, with a, a unique sequence so that we could identify them just looking at them through binoculars later um, if we can find them on Lexington, plus a unique metal band. Uh, and then here's all the equipment to process just one bird. And that doesn't even show the radios, which are here. Um, every bird we put a, an instrument on. Um, these are a, a low tech, what's called a low tech transmitter. Um, it's a VHF transmitter that should have a battery life of about two years. Um, it's a line of sight transmitter, um, relatively low power. Um, we put those on, I think, what, 69 of the birds. And then on six of the birds, we put a, a satellite a GPS uh, transmitter. Um, this is almost a $3,000 device. Um, this is a $300 device. So just the equipment was you know, quite an investment. Um, the transportation was an interesting thing. I was put in charge of, okay, how are we gonna keep these birds in the best shape possible as we transport them almost 500 miles across the state? Um, I did that by contacting some of the experts in the world on prairie grouse transport, um, which is the veterinary team at the Houston Zoo. Um, they're in charge of the captive population of Atwater prairie chicken um, that's bred there um, and then transported hundreds of miles for release into other parts of coastal Texas and I believe Louisiana as well. Um, what they told us was 24 hours was the max you should hold them. So if we're, if we're catching them at 7 a.m. in Miles City, we need to turn them out by 7 a.m. in Western Montana the next day. Um, what you worry about the most with them is hyperthermia, not getting too cold, but rather getting too hot. Um, they struggle the whole time they're in these boxes um, and um, they can overheat quite easily. Um, we also had some 90 degree days when we were transporting birds across the state. You know how hot it was last summer. And so we would um, uh, super cool um, uh, a couple of different suburbans we had um, that would rendezvous with each other in the middle of the state. We had one coming from Western Montana to Columbus. We had another coming from Miles City to Columbus. Um, the, the drivers would then swap car keys and, and everybody would go back to their original camp, but the birds would make it all the way to Western Montana. <clears throat> the transportation route. We would give them a final inspection when we got them to the west side to make sure we, their radio was still on them. We knew they would lose weight during transportation, probably almost uh, 15 to 20 percent of their body weight. And we wanted to make sure uh, that in that 24 hours they didn't slip out of the harnesses we put on them with, with the radios. And so we'd always have to inspect that. We didn't have a single radio get slipped um, during transportation. Then when we got them to the west side, um, we had places to turn them out at three different left locations that we had um, identified in, in the three different valleys that we, where we created an artificial lek. We put up decoys, photographic decoys of, of sharp tails. We broadcast sharp tail vocalizations um, and we turned them out onto these spots um, uh, using a release box that had six different compartments. These release boxes were, were built by Lewis Young on, on the model of, of uh, the ones they had created for the Tobacco Plains effort. 
um, and we would release them at, at dawn um, on, on these legs, um, opening each compartment at 10 minute intervals so the birds would come out only one at a time. We didn't want to create a mass flush of birds by uh, letting them all out simultaneously. Um, this was a sort of a soft release method. Um, here, here's a bird that had been released. You can see his radio on, on the back. He stood around this particular decoy for a little while. We also sprinkled berries on the leg, um, choke cherries, service berries, cranberries, things that would color them. You would immediately attract their interest. And we watched them feed often within seconds of being let out of the boxes. They needed nutrients um, and sugars quickly. The satellite birds uh, that were wearing those devices, um, this is the kind of data we've been collecting out of them. Um, Dr. McNew from, from MSU has been shocked by how closely the birds have stayed in the places we've released them to. Um, none of them, as best as we know, has tried to fly back to Miles City yet. Um, we know there have been some mortalities, but we've also been pleased with uh, generally the survival rate this fall. Um, part of that maybe is because we had such a mild fall. Uh, we didn't really get snow on the ground until December, right? Um, but uh, the birds seem to be doing well. We know uh, we've confirmed seven mortalities out of the 75. Undoubtedly, there's some more birds that have been lost out there, but we haven't found their, their transmitters yet. This is how the, the MODIS fixed antennas work. Um, uh, basically, you can just tell that there's still birds present in the, in the basin below where these antennas are set or overlooking. Um, this shows the Bitteru Valley release site. The birds were released over in, in this area, and there's um, four antennas in that part of that valley that are picking up. Um, this is a single bird and its movements um, in, in the basin below those antennas. We have reasons for optimism about this project, um, even though historically maybe we shouldn't. There's been a lot of failures with efforts to try and introduce sharp-tailed grouse and, and prairie chickens for that matter. Part of it probably has to do with the fact that they need a, a large landscape and a relatively large population to remain genetically viable. Um, part of it's probably also the social component of their behavior, the fact that they use lex traditionally that they need to return to year after year. Um, but uh, at the moment, we're optimistic about this one um, because we have um, some sharp-tailed grouse populations as sources that are near historic highs in central and eastern Montana, so we have a good place to go and get birds. Um, there's a lot of no conversion easements on the landscapes that we're putting the birds into, so we think they're going to look like what they look like now for a long time. There are some areas with improved grassland and riparian management. Um, there's increased fire on the landscape, and that may actually be a good thing. As much as we hate having smoke in the summers in western Montana, it might ultimately be something that's good for sharp-tailed grouse. Also, sharp-tails will use created habitats, lands that have been logged, wheat fields, orchards, CRP grassland, unlike sage grouse which very much don't use created habitats, except for maybe the occasional edge of an alfalfa field. They need old growth sagebrush and bunch grass and forbs full stop, whereas sharp tails will use a lot of created habitats. We also now have new techniques for monitoring the genetic health of small populations. Some of it pioneered with sage grouse that's now being applied to, to sharp tails that we think will be helpful. We also have groups like Audubon Society um, that has, in the case of sagebrush steppe and sage grouse conservation, established important bird areas for sage grouse in different parts of Montana. Um, one of the things about sage grouse conservation that will be an upside for sharp tails um, is even though it's not the case in Western Montana, in the rest of Montana, sharp tails and sage grouse are sympatric. And the type of management that is generally good for sage grouse, um, sharp tails will fit right in. And so the investments for sage grouse will help sharp tails as well. Sharp tails are also tolerant of smaller habitat patches. Uh, whereas you know, sage grouse are known to pick up and potentially sometimes migrate 60 or 80 miles in a tough winter, 
Um, shark tails don't need that. They don't need that huge contiguous piece of habitat. Um, and that fits more with what we have in Western Montana. So what are the next steps gonna be? Well, right now we have uh, males being monitored um, in the Western Montana Valley. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has just hired somebody um, to be on their staff to, to lead that, that effort. Um, that person, his name is Brad Bayless. Uh, um, he will know where the surviving birds are next spring. Um, and that's where we'll bring uh, the next bunch of, of shark tails for release, that 180 uh, females and males. Um, females are a lot harder to trap than males. They only spend um, maybe two mornings a spring on a lek, um, whereas the males spend 45 days during the course of a spring on a lek. So we don't expect to necessarily get 90 of these birds to be females, but we'll catch as many as we can. Um, we think their attendance will peak around the first week of April. In the decade ahead, um, we'll transplant a total of over 700 grouse if we can catch them and, and move them. And this will be during any four of the next nine years is sort of the way the commission uh, order at this point reads. Uh, they gave us uh, permission to trap five of the next 10 years. Um, we've just used up one of those years, so we're down to four of the next nine. Um, we'll have agencies and, and landowners and citizens surveying, trapping, and tracking the birds. We'll have, we hope to raise enough money to have more habitat quality assessment going on so we understand the types of habitats the birds are selecting for, as well as the stressors that are causing failures um, with some of those birds. We'll be tracking the genetics of the population and uh, we hope to have more partners. So I couldn't tell you right now if, if uh, the next 10 years, is it, is it sunrise for shark tails in Western Montana or is it the final sunset? Um, we won't know until we've moved those 700 birds and uh, see how they're doing. Here's the partners we have. MPG Ranch, I mentioned, very important. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks with their funds from Cucanusa. Department of Interior BLM, who's letting us trap birds from their surface, uh, almost uh, without exception. Groups like the Big Seven Bird Association, the University in Bozeman, the Phil Wright Zoological Museum, and Grizzly Liquor that supplies all of those cardboard boxes. <laughs> Here's some of the photos. I, I don't have photo credits for everybody, um, but these are the people that contributed the majority. We got through that faster than I thought. That's great. So, yeah. They those liquor boxes full or not? They must start that way somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Start saving them. Yeah. Uh, Carol online asked um, a couple questions. One of them was, "How much did the DNA analysis cost?" That would have been, I think, the beginning of your presentation when you were talking about some of those um, historical ones. Right. I, I think that the first um, round of, of genetic analysis we did was um, right around eight thousand um, dollars. There has been some subsequent work done and will be ongoing. Um, and we budget that at about an additional $7,000 per year. Um, it's doing a more detailed um, look at the, the genetics of the individuals. Yeah. Now, on that, wouldn't it be a lot more cost efficient to raise the birds instead of transplant them from 500 miles across the state? Um, there's about two bucks per bird. Right. Um, that there's a, a lot of um, discussion that goes on about um, cultivating birds in captivity and releasing them into the wild um, in terms of um, what is the quality of the birds that are released into the wild that are, that are raised in an artificial environment. Um, some of the things that is seen generally with domestic pheasant, if you want to call them that, birds that have been in captivity for so many generations, 
uh, and then released into the wild. And, and granted, it depends how you do it. If you raise them in a small, tight little cage versus a large flight cage, it allows them to get better physical conditioning before we release that sort of thing. Um, but they're, they tend to die much faster than wild transplanted birds. Um, and it's probably because they don't have the skill set they need to avoid predation. Um, they don't necessarily, a, a hen pheasant um, in the wild will actually start talking to her chicks before they even hatch um, through, through the eggshell, teaching them essentially pheasant language. Um, and um, yet birds that are hatched out of an incubator tray um, don't have even that foundation. And so they may not understand what a feeding call is, what a gathering call is, what a, what a caution or alarm call is. And that might be one of the reasons they, they die sooner in the wild. They also tend to do things like uh, a domestic pheasant um, released into the wild. If it gets scared or wants some shelter, it will run under and hide under a picnic table because it kind of looks like what it was raised in amongst cages and, and, and pens, as opposed to going into a cattail patch, um, which it's never seen before, um, which is where we know all the wild things go. Um, so, um, also, nobody has ever had any success breeding sharp tails in captivity in large numbers. Yeah, just three. I have, like the southern states, like Nebraska, have a uh, sharp tail drought reintroduction system where they'll pay for the chicks to raise them and then they distribute them. Make sure I'm good. Could you give me some information on that? I've never heard of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I tell you, obviously, you have more information. Okay, okay. And Montana doesn't have any. Right. We, we, Montana has prided itself since the 1980s in, in not breeding pheasants in captivity for release. Um, that has just changed uh, with this administration. Um, we, we decided to start releasing domestic pheasants, um, again, mostly for the sport of children. Um, they're learning to hunt. And um, I personally would rather they spend the money on habitat improvement. Um, I think we can prove that we can grow a lot more pheasants sustainably by putting, by having good habitat on the ground than by putting pen raised birds into the wild. We have a couple more questions online. One of them is um, Can you explain how, why the birds lost so much weight in the transfer? Yeah. Stress or, you know. They, they tend to be very high strung. Um, they, they also, in the wild, uh, feed themselves probably hourly, um, as long as food's available. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you put them through an awful lot of what they consider to be near-death experiences. Is they're, they're, they get handled four times in the process of, of being released in, in Western Montana. Um, and, and so uh, they're bouncing around inside even a darkened box um, almost the entire time um, you're moving them. Um, and, it, and it's just simply very, very stressful. And, and uh, they needed calories immediately upon release. Um, one of the things I had asked the veterinary team about in Houston was, could the birds benefit at all from what's called um, gravage? Is that it? Um, where you actually can tube feed them. Sometimes I, I actually used to work for a veterinarian that um, specialized in exotic birds, valuable macaws, cockatoos, things like that. And we frequently saved birds um, that were sick, um, that had stopped feeding um, by putting uh, uh, high nutrient, high calorie meals into their crop by hand, um, pushing it in with a syringe and tube. And I asked them if, if there was a chance of that being helpful for transport, they said no. They were too concerned about these birds being so high strung and bouncing around in these boxes so much that they, um, it, it wouldn't necessarily be a benefit to them. There's actually a chance of them aspirating and getting pneumonias out of something like that. So we decided to, to, to back off and just have our number one priority be move them fast, get them back out on the ground within 24 hours. But yeah. Ben, I'm curious about the uh, artificial lex. Do you have access to any known or anecdotal locations that had been lex? We actually did. Uh, uh, one of the three release locations was on the Manly Ranch right outside Helmville. Um, and that is the last um, lek active um, in the Blackfoot Valley that I researched. 
um, and actually caught birds off of and put some radios on to try and understand what was going on with them. Unfortunately, that like was down to four birds, four males by the time um, I was funded to put some radios on them and winked out within a year after that. So we, we did have one historic like location that we turned birds out onto. The, the, the imagery of the satellite tag birds are actually birds moving off of that same very close to that historic lake. So we know it looks right to them. Is there any a good area for us? What's that? That's to be a good area for us. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a, do you want or need any help from Flight at Audubon or our members? And Gail's asking that online. Yeah. Well, um, potentially, you know, I, I think we would probably like to visit with uh, all of the Audubon chapter statewide and see who's interested. Um, one of the, the things that would be a great advantage, we have people like Lewis Young coming from as far away as, as Eureka um, to participate, but it would also be wonderful to have some um, Audubon members in central Montana that are already familiar with some of those lakes, some of those landscapes, some of those landowners um, that could really facilitate us um, uh, having more source lakes and more familiarity with, with source populations out there. Yeah. Is this uh, traditionally? Uh, west of the Continental Divide, um, Aldrich characterized the sharp tails as being Colombian sharp tailed grouse. Right. And, and the advantages is that the birds from that population would have been in there since they historically did? Well, uh, Aldrich was wrong. Oh, okay. um, what, what our genetic analysis showed was that the birds from, yeah, from both the Flathead Valley and the Blackfoot Valley historically were more closely related to the plain shark tail east of the divide than the ever so far. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Any plans to do a try again to get a new one? At this time, I'm not aware of it. Um, I, I think there was a a sense out of the um, couple hundred birds they moved there um, that there just wasn't enough um, intact habitat left. Um, in particular, not so much on the U.S. side of, of, of the international border there, but um, very much on the Canadian side. That tremendous amount of subdivision and home construction had occurred, um, and they thought they had, had lost um, the minimum amount of habitat needed there. 